Now, I want to go to the second part of this here. He did a speech. Let's see. Oh, I have to share it in a specific way. I apologize for the technical issues today, folks. Uh, it seems like it's been a little bit of a rough week with the audio. Let's see if it's going to go to that. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, when I did when I did Ron's show, that same crackly audio issue popped up. And I had to switch back over to the headphones. So I think either something is wrong with the wiring or something is wrong with the card, which is the, uh, the streaming platform that I use. Oh, there it goes. See, it just reset itself for virtually no apparent reason. And it's going to play this dumb fucking video uh, that they have at the top. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow everything down. Man, I, I'm I'm really scared. Be kind of not a great live stream because all the technical issues. The website's not even loading, which is such an annoying fucking pain in the ass. New efforts there tonight from the Biden administration. To Can you, you guys hear that? Come, that's not the video we're gonna watch. Uh, the video we're gonna watch is down here. It's like a it's it's a rather short video, but I'll 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 stop in and out and kind of give my commentary to to you know some of the portions of it. Um, Again, I apologize for tech issues. My computer seems to be having some issues. My board seems to be having some issues. Boy, howdy! I I, I wish that uh, I wish that this was a little bit smoother today. Um, so I apologize. I apologize for that. I do want to take a look to see if Rockfin has any comments. Uh, audio sounds like a gigameter. So much better. Thanks. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, oh man, I feel like such a dick, you guys, today. All right, uh, let's, let's go to this video. So this is him talking about the executive orders and the whole racial equity stuff, right? Well, in my campaign for president, I made it very clear that the moment it arrived as a nation where we faced deep racial inequities in America and system, systemic racism that has plagued our nation for far, far too long. I, before we keep going, I do also want to mention, you know, one of the things that I, that I did notice while watching this, I've watched this like two or three times just to make sure that I picked up what he was saying. He stumbles quite a bit, even in, in a prepared speech. And I'm not saying this to be like, oh, look at Joe Biden stumbling around. Blah, blah. No, I'm saying like, this is a guy that has some clear cognitive deficiencies. And, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if like, there's a lot going on here that he's done in a week, um, you know, from these executive orders and given speeches and things of that sort. And someone of, of his age and with his cognitive deficiencies, like this is a lot and you can kind of see it. You can kind of see it in this, that he's, he's cognitively having some issues um, even with the prepared speech, even with the prepared speech, some of the stuff he's stumbling over. So it, it's something that I noticed where I'm like, ah, man, you know, we fucking put this old guy into the most stressful job uh, in politics to be the president or what what have you. And, you know, like maybe we fucking shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, all right. I said that over the course of the past year that the blinders have been taken off the nation, the American people. What, Mary, what many Americans didn't see or had simply refused to see couldn't be ignored any longer. Those uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds that took George Floyd's life opened the eyes of millions of Americans and millions of people around all over the world. It was the knee on the neck of justice, and it wouldn't be forgotten. It stirred the conscience and of tens of millions of Americans. And in my view, it marked a turning point in this country's attitude toward racial justice. Okay, starting to clip there. Um, because, 
you know, he, he talks about the George Floyd murder and it was, it was a murder, you know, that, that is what it was. <laughs> there is really no argument about that. And he talks about how it stirred up, you know, oh, it, it made people realize the racial inequalities uh, in this country, which is a half accurate statement. I mean, it did. It, it, it shed another light on racial inequalities in this country, but this is not the first time that we have seen massive racial inequalities, especially within the, within the context of police brutality. That's not the first time we've seen it. I mean, going back to the early days of what policing was, they were slave hunters. That's racial inequality. They were literally hunting runaway slaves. That's racial inequality, right? Then you move forward. They were attacking strikers. And who were the strikers fighting for? They were fighting for all of the working class, which includes black Americans. It included black Americans in the early 1900s. There were a few unions and there were a few... Uh, labor organizations that were racist, but those organizations didn't, you know, they, they don't last very long because they're they're exclusionary and they're misogynist and they're this, that, and the third, right? So, um, so that's that's sort of an important distinction to make here because he he brings it up like, oh man, twenty twenty was the first time America realized that there was a race a, a problem with race. Oh my goodness, right? And it goes back to the Trump derangement syndrome where it's like, oh, all this racist stuff really started when Trump got into office. Holy shit. And it really didn't, right? In the 60s, cops were killing black people. And then the Panthers had to step in. The Black Panthers were the only ones doing something because there was no justice system for them. And then under the Obama administration, it was Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, the list goes on and on and on. That was under the Obama administration. And they could have done something about that then. They could have talked about racial equality and racial equity, which is what he's going to focus on in, in, during the speech. This isn't some major epiphany for a lot of people. It's been going on. We've been yelling about it for a long time. What, George, what, what happened after the George Floyd incident is that it got too big. It was too big to ignore. And because it was too big to ignore, and because it brought these quote-unquote fringe political ideas into the mainstream, it made these politicians have to reconsider the way that they have been legislating for the last 50, 60 years. What this tells me is that over the course of just one year, they started listening and they started paying attention and they still won't do it. Because if this is what it is, the next, next words out of his mouth should be, I'm defunding the police <laughs> and I'm going to refund uh, community, community programs, restructure the police to community-based policing. I'm going to give more money to social and mental health programs, more money to education, uh, and and just go from there, right? But but he but he won't. Let's he'll let's the listen to this. Six year old daughter Gianna, who I met with when I met with the family, I leaned down to say he's talking about George Floyd's daughter. Looked at me, she said, "Daddy changed the world." That's what Gianna said. His daughter, "Daddy changed the world," and I believe she was right. Not because this kind of injustice stopped, it clearly hasn't, but because the ground has shifted, because it's changed minds and mindsets, because it laid the groundwork for progress. COVID so, again, if he is able to recognize this stuff, then there is nothing that he shouldn't look at that six-year-old girl and be like, yeah, you know what, your daddy did change the world. And I'm going to do my part in, in changing that. I have supported some pretty terrible policies in the past, and I'm going to do, make an effort in acknowledging what that is and then going forward by changing some of those policies and listening to what communities of color are actually telling me. Yeah, so, so let's defund the police. Let's put more money into mental health. Let's put more money into social program. Let's put more money into housing. Let's put, let's put more money in getting people off of the streets and getting them into homes and, and giving them decent jobs and decent wages. 
Let's build let's build a, a culture where, where not only people of color can thrive, but everybody can thrive. I will do that. But that's again not where this is going. And and this because and to me, I, I listened to this and I listened to the rest of the speech, and I was like, this girl is, is a political stunt. That's what you use this this little girl as. You used her as a fucking political stunt. And that sucks, man. Like you shouldn't be using a six year old girl. You know, it's it's very similar to I spoke with Jimmy in Iowa. He's a farmer. And it's like, yeah, but you're not doing anything to fucking help that farmer. I un I listen to the strife that he goes through. He wakes up at four in the morning every day. It's like that's that's basically the same thing that he did. You basically use her as a political tool, but you're not you're not listening to what the movement is saying needs to happen in order to uplift communities of color. COVID-19 has further ripped a, a path of destruction through every community in America, but no one has been spared. But the devastation in communities of color has been nothing short of stunning. Just look at the numbers. 40% of frontline workers, nurses, first responders, grocery store workers, are Americans of color. Oh, boy. One in 10 black Americans is out of work today. One in 11 Latino Americans is out of work today. One in seven households in America, about one in four black, one in five Latino households in America, report that they don't have enough food to eat in the United States of America. Black and Latino Americans are dying of COVID-19 at rates nearly three times that of white Americans. And it's not white Americans' fault, but just a fact. And the Americans now know it, especially young. <laughs> I feel like that little last statement was kind of weird, right? It, it's like, it's not white Americans' fault, but it's just a fact. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird statement. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just me uh, that thinks that's a weird little statement there. But uh, it it really felt like it was a weird statement to me. Uh, but here's the thing. If you know all this information, right, you know all the suffering that's going on, you know that people are out of work, they can't put food on their table, they're waiting, you know, for, for some kind of help, and it's communities of color suffering and da 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 da, da and all this other stuff, and, and, you know, why aren't those $2,000 checks going out? Why wasn't that the first thing you were going to do? Wouldn't that also help communities of color? Not just that. Why are you not using an executive order under Section 1881A of the Social Security Act to give everybody health care? Why are you not doing that? Why are you not saying, you know what, in order to really help these people during a pandemic with these rising unemployment rates and so on and so forth, that I'm going to... Uh, authorize a UBI. I'm going to push Congress to approve a UBI. Where where are those things? That's missing in this conversation. Listening to these facts, knowing them, understanding them, but doing nothing about it when you're in a position of power where you can do something about it is just purposeful cruelty. That's not empathy or understanding. You understand the problem. You're just not going to do anything about it. That's purposeful cruelty, and that's apathy. Let us continue. Younger Americans. One of the reasons I'm so optimistic about this nation is that the, today's generation of young Americans is the most progressive, thoughtful, inclusive generation that America has ever seen. And they are pulling us toward justice in so many ways, forcing us to confront the huge gap in economic, excuse me, economic inequity between those at the top and everyone else. By the way, no empathy for this generation that has all this love and, 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 is, and, and inclusion and is pushing for racial <laughs> equality. No empathy for them. Not this guy, not Joe Biden. Get out of here, you kids. With your, we should all be treated equally. I'm inspired by you, but I have no empathy. 
I'm sorry. Again, uh, th this is a part of the speech where it's like, do you understand what you said two years ago? Like, you basically said, fuck young kids. Fuck them. I don't care. Why would I give a shit? You guys complain and ask for too much. What really bothers me about all this is the absolute lack of acknowledgement and accountability for his past. <laughs> like, it's crazy to me that he doesn't have any of that. All right. Forcing us to confront the existential crisis of climate. And yes, forcing us to confront systemic racism and white supremacy. It's just been weeks since all of America witnessed a group of thugs, insurrectionists, a political extremist, and white supremacists violently attack the capital of our democracy. And so now, now's the time to act. It's time to act because that's what the faith and morality call us to do. Across nearly every faith, the same principles hold. We're all God's children. We should treat each other as we would like to be treated ourselves. And this is time to act, and this time to act because it's what the core values of this nation call us to do. And I believe the vast majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, share these values and want us to act as well. We have never fully lived up to the founding principles of this nation, to state the obvious, that all people are created equal and have a right to be treated equally throughout their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think America has ever held up to that. That's true. Right? And and the him him talking about everybody has to do their part kind of sounds like socialism. Sounds like collectivism. I like that he brought up um you know this idea of religion. That all throughout religion they're the the one of the core tenets is treat others as you want to be treated. Yeah, that's one of the core tenets of the religion. Yeah, and and how many politicians say that they are religious and that this is a Christian nation? Yet there is not one policy, there is not an action that they have taken that would reflect as such, that would reflect that this is an actual Christian nation. It's just they don't do that sort of stuff. So how can you claim that you're you, you, that this is a moral religious country that's on the founding principles of Christianity when you don't act that way? And you brought up the founding fathers. Biden himself hasn't been able to live up to that creed that was set out by the founding fathers to create all men as equal. The dude has created... Legislation after legislation, the three strike rule, the 94 crime bill, supporting the war on drugs, that has been about inequality, that was targeted towards communities of color. He supported segregationists in the 60s, and he's talking about, oh, this country. Doesn't stay. No, you also don't. You need to take it. You have to say something. When that has been a core tenet of your 40 some odd years in public office, that you supported uh, segregationists and have been the one of the architects of major racist crime bills. But I guess much like the founding fathers, he himself was practicing the great art of hypocrisy. And it's time to act now, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because if we do, we'll all be better off for it. For too long, we've allowed a narrow, cramped view of the promise of this nation to fester. You know, we've, uh, we've bought the view that America is a zero-sum game in many cases. If you succeed, I fail. If you get ahead, I fall behind. If you get the job, I lose mine. Maybe worst of all, if I hold you down, I lift myself up. We've lost sight of what President Kennedy told us when he said, a rising tide lifts all boats. And when we lift each other up, we're all lifted up. You know, and the corollary is true as well. When Did... Uh... 
Did Joe Biden watch one of my videos? <laughs> I said the same shit like weeks. I've, I've been saying a bunch of this stuff, right? That's sort of the thing that they've been sold, that 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 conservatives and neoliberals have been sold, that if uh, if if uh, someone like me, a, a, a brown immigrant succeeds, uh, then that means that a white man has failed. You know, that's the way that they talk about immigrant communities, right? Like, oh, they're coming to steal your jobs. What, what, what are you talking about? They're not stealing your jobs. The, cor the uh, corporations are hiring them and, and the immigrants are forced to take less wages in order to support their... What are you talking about? They look at equality as a limited resource. No, oil is a limited resource that we shouldn't be digging around for. Equality applies for everyone. It's sort of this unlimited thing. It's it's a it's a concept, and you either have the will to choose it or you don't. He kind of just gave away this big secret that that neoliberals and capitalists uh, use propaganda to spread around. That's how they prop up their system. Capitalism is in a system that is based on inequality. Oh, there it goes. It's going to reload. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, sorry about this. It must have. It must have heard no me. Efforts tonight from the Biden administration to ramp up vaccination efforts across. Boy, this website fucking hates me. Uh, this website fucking hates. This is why corporate media sucks. And this is why you should not have like a million fucking ads on your on your website. Because it does this shit and it reloads so that it gets new ads up. Ugh. So fucking annoying. Anyway, the point is, he could he could have done something about this, yeah? Like, he could he could change the, the, the way people think. Once again, taking into admission that he himself was part of this system. That he himself preached things like this. But again, what this what what he's doing is again by by basically saying like, oh, George Floyd was the first time America realized that we have this rampant racism problem. Who was president when George Floyd happened? Donald Trump. All of that falls on Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the reason why racism happened in America, which is simply not true. All right, let me let me find where I am since this fucking website decided to. In my campaign, bail on it here. Sorry about this, folks. I feel bad about today's live stream. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Proven this. Okay. When any one of us is held down, we're all held back. Here we go. More and more economic studies in recent years have proven this. But I don't think you need economic studies to see the truth. Just imagine if instead of consigning millions of American children to under resourced schools, we gave each and every three, four-year-old child a chance to learn, to go to school, not daycare, to school, and grow, and thrive in school and throughout. When they've done that, the places have been done, it shows they have an exponentially greater chance of going all the way through 12 years of school. Should we all play records for them, too? But, you know, does anyone, does anyone in this whole nation think we're not all better off if that were to happen? Just imagine. If instead of denying millions of Americans the ability to own a home and build generational wealth, we made it possible for them to buy a home, their first home, and began to build equity to provide for their families and send their children off to school. Does anyone doubt that the whole nation would be better off? Just imagine, instead of denying millions of young entrepreneurs the ability to access capital, we made it possible to take their dream to market create jobs, reinvest in their own communities. Does anyone doubt this whole nation wouldn't be better off? So again, I mean, this notion of equity, right, is 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 another capitalist thing of like, oh, you build debt and you build debt and you build this equity and then you make a better life for yourself. He's, I mean, he's preaching, he's preaching some capitalist shit. Uh, and, and no one denies that having a better education and, and people being housed with a, with with you know a comfortable way of living would yield that the next generation would probably have a comfortable way of living no one's denying that shit no one's denying that innovation 
is a good thing. Like, no, one, <laughs> no one's denying any of that. But, but within capitalism, within the structure that he's talking about, taking it to market, building equity. Yeah, building equity also involves debt. So, you know, what, what, you, shouldn't, you, should, you should be talking about moving away from debt, moving away from an economy that is built around debt. What he should do if he actually gave a shit about kids living a better life, about people being able to own their first home, and so on and so forth. He would cancel all student debt. He would cancel all the student debt and figure out a way to get public colleges, free public colleges, or, or do what the, uh, what the UK does, which is charge way fucking less for their colleges. You can't afford a decent education in this country with the wages that are being forced upon the working class of America. And now we're talking about it's going to be $15 an hour in five years. In five years? What are you talking about? This has been a fight that people have been on the forefront of for 15 years, and you're going to make them wait another five years? And, you're, and you still have the gall to come out and say, oh, I'm helping people build. No, you're not. You're not. You're not doing anything to help people build a better life for themselves right now. Now, I want to fast forward here um, to a different portion. Because uh, he talks more Just imagine about more let's imagine, let's imagine. Innovative, how much more creative and innovative. So right around here. Understanding and truth, not ignorance and lies. Today, I'm also issuing an executive order that will ultimately end the Justice Department's use of private prisons, private prisons, an industry that houses pretrial detainees and detainees and federal prisoners. The executive order directs the Attorney General to decline to renew contracts with privately operated criminal facilities a step we started to take at the end of the Obama administration and was reversed under the previous administration. This is the first step to stop corporations from profiting off of incarcerating, incarceration that is less humane and less safe, as the studies show. And it is just the beginning of my administration's plan to address systemic problems in our criminal justice system. So, all right, I think there's... Not much else in this video that uh, I would want to talk about here. So, but you know, he talks about oh, the Obama administration was already taking steps to do all this stuff, which I don't remember that. Um, if, if I'm if I'm wrong, you know, let me know. If if you guys know, if you guys remember something that I don't, please do let me know. Uh, but I don't remember that. What what I do remember is Obama went to prisons and talked to prisoners. I do remember that that show of thing faith and talked about how nonviolent criminal offenders should be, you know, ta oh, we, we shouldn't be putting these people in prison and da, 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 da. And then he talked up how great, you know, marijuana is and it would help the economy and this, that, and the third, and then did none of it. At the end of his term, he had an opportunity to federalize, uh, federally legalize cannabis for all uses, medical and recreational, at, which would have opened up a whole new uh, crop of businesses all across the country. And he didn't do that. He kept marijuana to be a scheduled drug. Uh, he kept the people that have nonviolent drug offenses in prison when he could have very easily uh, used a, um, uh, an executive pardon to get these people out of prison. And really try to start, re that would have been the core to, to rebuild, not commute them. Because here's the, the difference, right? If, so this happened to Chelsea Manning, which is he commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence and she was thrown back in prison, uh, you know, in a, in a, and then coerced to try to get, get to, um, Chelsea to turn on Assange. But had he pardoned her, it would have been impossible for them to do that. So we're not talking about commuting these people fucking out of prison. Get them out of prison. 
You address the prison labor problem. You address the uh, nonviolent criminal offense problem. Why are these people in the same prison as murderers? Because they had a plant that you don't particularly understand or like. And you change the, the drug laws. You remove marijuana as a Schedule One drug. He had the ability to do that, and he didn't fucking do it. Because he's just like every other president. He's a corporate toady. That's what he is. He turned out to be just as much of a neoliberal president as everybody else before. The hope and change was for, for nobody. The hope was essentially for big businesses. The hope was for the upper echelon, the oligarchy. Not for the people down below. Build Back Better is not Build Back Better for, for the working class in this country. It's, it's for Wall Street. It's for corporations. It's for the oligarchs that run this nation. That's who it's for. I mean, look at what happened with GameStop, right? I, I didn't even think I was going to talk about this, but it, it, this just kind of flows right into it. But look at what happened with GameStop. You had a bunch of people betting against it. This is, this is something that's completely legal to do within the hedge fund world, within Wall Street. It's completely legal to do is to, is to ensure that a stock will tank so that you make money off of betting against something. This is what they did in 08 with the housing collapse. Nothing changed when, when the fucking bankers played this game and fucked over t tens of millions of Americans out of their homes. But a bunch of nerds on Reddit decide that they want to fucking help GameStop. And they start buying stocks. Cheap. And it rises by 8,000%. And a bunch of hedge fund assholes lose like billions of dollars. I think it was like uh, one of the reports I saw, it said $2.7 billion. The other, there was another report that said $13 billion. I hope it's fucking $13 billion because that's just a minute, small amount of money that you fuck stole from us. And now we're giving it right back. And look what's happening now. 24 hours, not even 24 hours later. Janet Yellen, not even 24 hours later. Janet Yellen was like, oh, we're going to look into this to make sure it never happens again. And now they're like, oh, we're going to look and into encrypted data to make sure that, you know, people aren't talking about buying these, these stocks that these hedge fund managers have, uh, have betted against so that they make billions of dollars off of uh, the misery of others. No one can stop us from doing that because now we're going to monitor it. Monitor it, and if you if you even come close to doing that, that yeah, the game is being played for the people up at the top. Where if we play the same game as them, they fucking get pissed. That's who Joe Biden represents. And you know that because there's zero fucking accountability from him for being a part of industries that do that for writing the crime bill, for creating the prison industrial complex, for creating the mass incarceration program. And Kamala Harris is, is, is part of that problem too. How can you really create healing? How can you really apologize if you're not going to take accountability for what you did? And, and it all goes back to the fact that they're all lawyers and they don't want to be sued or they don't want to you know, have any sort of legal action pursued against them. And they talk about equity, not equality, right? It's the cost of racism. Well, that should be reparations. How are you going to uh, monetarily fix this issue with, within communities of color? Fuck, you can't even handle giving $1,400, which it should be 2000 which it should be 2000 a month, but you can't even handle that. You lied about the checks going out immediately, and then you lied about the amount, and then you lied about when. Like you keep, how are you going to handle that? How are you going to handle reparations for all communities of color that have been negatively affected by America for decades now? Until there's a a a, a total abolition of uh, private prisons that profit off of prison labor, that profit off of people being in prison, and a change in legislation in drug laws, this piece of incrementalism is not enough. We talked about this on um, 
uh, on, on Ron Placone's show earlier this week. I don't know if you if some of you guys caught it or not, but we talked about it there. Uh, where it's basically, you know, uh, he's there's no way he's going to be anywhere close to an FDR, but but Ron pointed out that he might be an LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, who was co basically but through public pressure was forced into doing some decent things like the Voting Rights Act and so you know supporting uh, the, some of the civil rights movement. LBJ didn't want to do that. LBJ was an asshole. That's what he was. People praise him for being an asshole. Like he belched and burped and like didn't wear pants and shit, which is crazy. <laughs> like got away with that shit but he you know i don't think he was this champion of, of civil rights i don't think he was a champion of of equality he did it because public opinion was changing public persona there was too much pressure coming from the ground floor that's what we need and i think when you look at what's happening with his um racial equity plan it very much feels like we're revising history here. And ignoring all of the shit that he has done and has contributed to bring us here, to bring us to this point of inequality. Let's look at some comments. Holly, good to see you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, you're cringing as you were watching that speech. Yeah, it's, it, he's, he's, I've, I've heard that. A lot of people cringe when he, when he talks. Uh, and the prison is a stroke. It is easier because of cheap labor in prison. Yeah, which should be uh, that's that's the way that they they uh, keep slavery involved. Uh, I want to check Rockfin comments real quick as well. Oh, the Geiger counter. Oh, that's what it sounded. Uh, Sarah points out that it, um, the earlier sound sounded like a Geiger counter uh, yeah, on on Rockfin. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad that got fixed. I have to figure out what the actual problem is uh, for people that uh, missed it earlier. We, it, it was, uh, it was, it, the audio was pretty, pretty awful. It sounded like there was a Geiger meter in the background, and I don't know if it's an issue with Streamyard because uh, it, it's happened twice now, specifically with Streamyard. So I'm going to have to run some tests uh, today in order to figure out what's going on with the audio. I've used Streamyard. I've used this microphone and the board. Um, for weeks now, so I don't know why the issue popped up today. Uh, mix that with a website that was draining, you know, all of the RAM for my computer, so it slowed everything down. Uh, I feel very terrible about today's live stream uh, in terms of quality. I, it should it should have been better, and I'm and I'm sorry for the folks that <laughs> had to experience the Geiger counter noise in the background. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.